open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And we are talking here about the role of the husband in marriage. And society has largely forgotten the role of the husband in marriage. I mean, they've forgotten the wife's role, that's for sure. In fact, some of society hates the wife's role as if it's a bad thing. Um, and it's a beautiful and glorious thing if you understand it correctly, biblically. Um, but I think that a vague memory of the role of the wife is still in society and in our culture today. But the husband's role is completely lost. It seems to me that of the two roles, the one that we need to be reminded of the most is the husband's role. Um, the the husband's role is just, I mean, here you've got Homer Simpson and Marge Simpson. You know what I mean? And the hus- and that Homer Simpson character is, is pretty much representative of so many of the Al Bundys and the various, um, you can tell what we watched when I was growing up. <laughs> um, it wasn't Little House on the Prairie in my... <laughs> In my house, but uh, but you can tell that the role of the husband is just kind of forgotten, and so a lot of guys have no idea what it means to be a man. And I could say the same thing for me when I was in my early twenties. If you were like, Mike, what does it mean to be a man? And I would have been like, That's a fantastic question. <laughs> I'm really not sure. And so this is going to speak to us about something about what it means to be a man and the role of a husband in the marriage. And um, God's call to husbands is so needful right now. It's so necessary. Um, The divorce rates are about 50% in America, in our country, about 50% divorce rates. The, um, and that's a whole complicated subject in and of itself. I'd love to tackle it sometime if we happen to get there verse by verse. But check this out. Those statistics radically change when you have a biblical marriage. Radically change. Just for those who save themselves for marriage, it drops to under 25%. Just that one act right there. Um, Now, for those who actually have a biblical concept of marriage, it just drops much greater. And so we've got God's God's plan is 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 good for us. It's like it is the right way to do it. You know, we've all been there, like on the job, and the boss comes along and he's like, "Don't do it that way. Do it this way." And you're thinking, "I've been doing this this way for 30 years, and you come along and you think you can tell me I can do something." But in this case, the boss is right. In this case, the boss is totally correct. He's like, no, you're doing it wrong. Do it this way. And that's the thing for, for husbands. So it's needful, but it's also very specific. There's more details about the husband's role than people sometimes realize. So I want to dig into the details of what I'm called to do and you, you guys are called to do and girls, what you can look for in your husband and throw in his face later on. So um, <laughs> I'm kidding, don't throw it in his face, but I, you know I'm joking. Um, but they're also very simple. So there's details, but they're very uncomplicated. And in that, God's given us these sort of rules or principles as husbands that easily apply to just about any scenario. You know, so it's not this like real detail, like, and if it's a Tuesday and she's feeling this way, then you should do It's Rather, it's these generic rules that are simple, specific, and super needful. And this will simplify your marriage. Um, I think that uh, there's a phrase I've heard in the past that if you understand something really well, you should be able to summarize it in a single short sentence. I think Einstein did this really well when he said E equals MC squared. Not that any of us understand what that means. <laughs> well, I can tell you what the symbols stand for, but don't, don't, don't ask me what it means. Um, but yeah, the, the, the statements from God in the scriptures about husbands and wives are, are short and simple. And we don't have a huge passages of scripture to unpack. We have these short, simple passages. So here we are reading uh, God's understanding, his understanding of marriage very well. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and, being, and as being heirs together in the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, this is where we are in 1 Peter, but because I'm going to take the topic of, of, of husband's roles, I'm going to actually come back to this after I go to a major teaching passage for husbands, and that's, you know it, it's Ephesians 5. So turn to Ephesians 5, then we're going to come back to 1 Peter. And after laying the foundation of this major teaching passage, the probably number one passage husbands should learn, memorize, have in their hearts as a daily mantra for themselves and their brides. And in Ephesians 5.25, it says this, Husbands, love your wives. It's a command. Love your wives. And then we're told how. Just as Christ also loved the church... And gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular, and here's the summary, verse 33. Here's the summary of marriage right here. If you know it well, you can summarize it, right? Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so there you have like the love and respect thing, that this sort of formula for marriage. Last week we talked about wives. This week we'll deal with the husbands. Um, the husband's chief responsibility is interesting to me because the husband is called to be the leader in the marriage. And the wife is to look at the husband and see him as the leader and as an authority in the home. But the husband's, his commands have nothing to do with leadership. And that's kind of strange. But when you realize this, that's because we won't have a hard time just telling people what to do. We have a hard time walking in love. This is, this is what's needful for me, you know, to walk in love. The moment my wife offends me, my tendency is to pull my love away from her and isolate her from that love that I have vowed to give to her. But God has told us to love our wives. This is my chief responsibility as a husband. Hers is submit and respect. Mine is agape love, self-sacrificial love. And so love is commanded. That's really interesting. Our society thinks of love as a feeling. It's difficult not to think of love as a feeling because of how many love stories have you seen? I mean, sometimes you watch a commercial and you just saw a love story. You, know? <laughs> it's, you see so many love stories. Very few movies don't have these love stories. Like I remember watching Lord of the Rings in the theater and I was like, I don't remember all this stuff about the, the, the Aragorn and uh, uh, Aowen or whatever her name was. I don't remember. Arwen. Aowen. Oh, that's some other girl. Yeah. Some other, other love story in the film. So, but I'm like, I don't even remember that. I read the books. I don't remember that. You know, that's interesting. And I, it's just that you've got to like have a love story. You know, it's just got to be there. But their version of love so often is off base because it's about the feelings of love. Now, let me try to be as clear as I can. Love is not feelings, though love has feelings. I think that that's a fair understanding of it. I know what it's like to just be madly in love. I mean, just head over heels in love. I remember not being able to sleep when we first uh, were dating and getting engaged and stuff like that. You know, now I can't sleep, but it's because of my back. It's a different reason. <laughs> but those, those are the emotions of love. And I consider those like the icing on like This is a wonderful treat. You know, it's a beautiful thing. I love it. I, and it's exciting. The, the heart, but the thing is, the heart goes there and gives you those feelings, even when what you have is not a godly love. You could have those feelings for someone who's not your spouse. These feelings do not make a relationship legitimate. And the lack of these feelings do not make a relationship illegitimate. So if someone's like, well, we fell out of love. Well, well, God never told you to fall in love. He told you to walk in love. And love is considered like more of like a verb in the scriptures. It's dealt with as a command. And the reason why it's commanded is because you can simply do it. I could say, stand up. And you guys would stand up. Would sit down and you'd sit down. Love. And you go, oh, well, I, I mean, you, can't, you can't force love. No, actually... You can. And that's really important. You can choose love. And that's the husband's role over and over again, day after day after day, is to choose to walk in love towards his bride. Now, if he does this, his feelings of love are most likely going to be there as well. If he doesn't do this, he'll probably lose those feelings. But you see how one causes the other, not typically the other way around. Love is commanded. It's not, we're not asked to feel love. We're asked to walk in love. So Ephesians 5.2, if you just look back on your page a little bit, you'll see, in fact, he tells us, walk in love. We're told, walk in love. And then the husband specifically, hey, your bride, she's the one you need to focus on really the most, on loving her. 2 John verse 6 says this, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment. That as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. And so someone could be like, I love God with all my heart. I'm just not really close to him right now. I'm not really following him or doing what he wants me to do. Then I would say, 
then you don't love God. Because if you love him, you'll obey his commands. But you're not walking in love. So what you have is good feelings toward God, but not actions of love toward God. And the same since husbands, we've got to have actions. Like 3D, real tactile things that we do towards our wives on a regular daily basis that are walking in love. So this is actually really simple, although it's, it's difficult. I get that. Because it requires the husband to come to a place where he dies to himself. And he's like, okay, I'm just going to do what you tell me to do, Lord. Um, because sometimes everything in me is wanting me to not be loving and not care and not put her first, but just to kind of isolate, kind of cut her off from here. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be the breadwinner or I'll be this, but I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm going I'm to break the relationship down. But she needs more than bread. <laughs> so, and so that's not good. There was a, a, a story of a husband who went to a counselor, a Christian counselor, and the husband's there and he says, counselor, the love is gone. You know, the thrill has gone away <laughs> and it is, it is no more. And the counselor said, well, you know, you're called to, to, to love your wife, husband, love your wife. And he says, but you don't understand. It's like, she's not even my wife. It's like, she, we're just neighbors, you know, it's like, we're just neighbors or she's my sister. And we're just, we're just living in the house together. And we go through our routine and I, I go, you know, over here and she goes over here and we hardly talk. And it's like, we're just acquaintances. We're just neighbors. And he says, well, the Bible says to love your neighbor. And he goes, you don't understand, okay? It's like this woman is not the woman I married. She's changed. She's different. It's like she's a stranger. It's like she's a stranger and I've never seen this woman before. I don't even know who she is. This isn't the woman I married. She's some stranger. And he says, well, the Bible says, love strangers. Love the stranger. And he says, no, you don't understand. It's like she's my enemy. <laughs> and I mean... It's like she tries to undermine my life and she does things just to hurt me and to wound me. I'm fearful that she will somehow try to poison me or do some great harm to me. And the counselor leans in and says, do you know what the Bible says about your enemies? <laughs> and I use this story to illustrate one thing. There is never a time when the husband's call to love his wife doesn't apply. It is a constant, constant call. It is always there. I'm always called to love my wife. Always, always, always. So that leads me to a question. How is the husband's love for his wife different than his love for anybody else? You know, because I could be like, well, I'm called to love everybody, you know, but there is a difference. Um, it's the same kind of thing. And I found this after being married. And I don't know if you discovered the same thing. This is just my personal opinion here. But I realized that the love I have for my bride is very much like the love I have for my sister or my mother or, or a brother of mine or a, or a good friend. It's really like, I don't know categories of love so much, but we have a different relationship in that. And now I'm not saying there's no romance. There's plenty of romance. That's not the issue. The issue is that, that love is love is love is love. I mean, biblical love is just is, is caring for the needs of others and putting them above yourself and that sort of thing. But how is it different? Well, marriage is my stewardship. And given that everyone has needs, hers come first. And that I want to love everybody and I want to take care of everybody as much as I can, but hers come first. Because she's my bride. And so that, that would be the husband's thing there is to go, okay, you know, there's times where I say I can't do an event or I, I won't be able to do something because I'm like, you know, we need to spend some time together. And our marriage is important. And that, out of the overflow of the home, comes the ministry to others and stuff. And so, so I think that, that it's the same type of love, but in a different um, category of, of, okay, your priority, numero uno, next to Jesus. And that was the deal I did when I got married. That was the vow I made. And that was the oath I took. So we're told how. We're told to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And then the description is given for how he loved the church. Because he did lots of things for the church. But specifically, oh, this is so, oh, this is, this is hard. This is hard. And it is serious. And it is, God is, entirely means it. Jesus took our sins, put them on himself, he paid the price so he could, what, forgive us and bring us back. There are times, possibly husband, when we will be called to take our wife's offense or hard thing that she may have done to us and simply suffer for it and forgive. And that this is walking in love. He came down for us. He humbled himself. He died for us for our sins. He put our needs far above his own 
when, when the church sinned against Christ, Christ paid for it, forgave her, and then drew the church to himself in love. That is intense. That is really intense. So that, as intense as it is, it's also very practical. I think as men, we like big showy, at least I do, like big showy things. You know, can I do something oh, like really huge for my bride? Like take, run in front of a bus for her or something. I don't know, you know, or do something great and grand. And one, uh, one date night, I'll remember, I'll never forget this because it just taught me so much. We were talking, what do you want to do on our date night? And I said, you know what, honey? Um, I just want to do, and this is because I was studying on marriage. And I want to apply what I'm studying. So I just want to do whatever would make you happy. Do you remember this? I said, I'll do whatever would make you happy. And she goes, you know what would really make me happy? She gets this look on her face. And I go, what? Just tell me. And she goes, if you fixed the bookshelf that broke. <laughs> so our date night was me fixing the bookshelf that broke in my hacky way of doing things. I'm fixing things. It works now. But that's good. <laughs> but, huh? You were there with me. I, we, she, it was actually a really nice date. Was it not? Was it not a really nice date, you know? So I think that this um, this putting her first thing is meant to be super practical and daily daily things. Um, you know, if we're going to go out to eat and she wants to eat here and I want to eat here, I'll, I'll go where she wants to eat. But Mike, you you make the decision in the marriage, yeah, and I decide to do whatever blesses her. Why? Because that's my call. That's what I'm called to do, under the authority of Christ. As I put my wife's needs above my own, I put her preferences above my own. I try to to do those things. I mean, if she wants to paint the bathroom pink. And thankfully she doesn't. But if she wants to paint the bathroom pink, and I'm going, that's going to look ridiculous. And she's like, but I really just want a pink bathroom. Well, it's not like it's a safety issue. You know, I don't think that that can induce seizures as far as I'm aware. But so, no, then we'll paint the bathroom pink. Whatever. Whatever. So this poses us with a real danger we have nowadays. Um, well, we've always had this danger. But nowadays, because we've exalted the feelings of love and we have not exalted the actions of love. And let me give you an example of this. Romeo and Juliet. This is not a love story. It is well written, but it is not a love story. <laughs> yeah, come on, really? <laughs> they, they throw their own families under the bus. They lie to everybody. Then they commit suicide at the idea of not being able to be with each other. Romeo and Juliet were fools. And if we can learn anything from them, it should be that we can't learn anything from them <laughs> about love or about caring. Romeo should have gone and said, I love your daughter. I'd like to marry her. And when they said never, he'd be like, well, then I'll wait and I'll prove myself to you. That's what he should have done. That would have been the romantic thing. That would have been the, the godly thing to do. But no, no. In fact, if you recall from the beginning of the movie, he had just gotten over his, because I'm sure you've seen the movie and not the play like me. He had just gotten over his love for Rosalind, I believe it was. Yeah. Literally five seconds before he saw Juliet and fell in love. Fell in love. More like fell on his face. But, but yes, the danger of falling in love. It's good to ask, why do you want to marry that person? You know, if you talk to a single person, you're like, so you're interested in them. Why do you want to marry that person? Is it because they're beautiful? Is it because you can talk together well? Is it because they make you feel good? I'll say those are beautiful things. But that will not sustain your marriage. How about it's because you've decided you want to love them and put their needs above yours until you die. Because that's what our call is as guys. We're called to put her needs above our own. If one of us is going to be cold, it should be you. If one of us is going to be sore, it should be you. I, I think that chivalry is a biblical principle to put her needs above our own. But um, let's, let's actually turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to look at another scripture relating to husbands. Relating to husbands. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32. Now, this is an observation that Paul makes. And actually, this passage is written to people um, either who are married, single, or people who are on the fence, who are deciding if they should get married or if they should stay single. So it's a really interesting passage. And it says here, but I want you to be without care. And he's speaking about how he, he thinks being single is better for the sake of the kingdom of God, which it is. Um, but he who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who's married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Now, it is true that this single person can spend so much more time serving God. I mean, they can go help out in the food line and they can go out and witness over here and there. But the married person needs to have a date night with their spouse. 
Like the fact that I'm married is the reason why I've been spending some of my day offs working on the house. Like I'll be honest, if I was single, I wouldn't have a house. I wouldn't need one, <laughs> you know, certainly wouldn't be working on it. But I am concerned with some of the things of the world, now not meaning ungodly things, but meaning material things, because I need to take care of my bride. I want to be a provider. I want to take care of her and provide an environment where she's safe. And that's a biblical idea. So here's the thing. There was years ago, several people who were saying that men of God, you know what? Just go out there and serve God and God will take care of your family and God will take care of your children. And this was sometimes what was being said, that they could basically not worry about taking care of their kids. But then that ignores 1 Corinthians 7, which says what? That the married man, and it's not a criticism, it's an observation. He cares about the things of this world, how he may please his wife. When I took on marriage, I took on a ministry that required me to be more concerned about material things than I previously was. And rightly so. And rightly so. That's a really interesting passage. You're welcome to look into 1 Corinthians 7 even more detail, but it's clearly there. Do you know Billy Graham? I mean, here's a guy who's been used greatly by God and, you know, so many uh, outreaches and all this stuff. Really cool. He was asked, though, what he would do differently if he could go back and talk to a young Billy Graham. And what would he say differently for him? And he said this, I would have spent more time at home. And I thought, whoa, that's really impressive. Like, whoa, you would have spent more time at home because his ministry required him to what travel all over the place to be all over the place, right? But he goes, I would have spent more time at home. That's, now, I'm not saying he failed or something like that, but that was his observation. And I think we can learn from that sort of thing. I have a responsibility at home. Now, because I'm married and hopefully God willing will one day have kids, that means that I will be able to do less ministry because of it. And that I may have an opportunity to do something that seems really great for God and I have to turn it down because it will have a bad impact on my family. And that is what I should do because that's the deal. And that's how I understand it. Um, so if you want to be without care, don't say, God, take care of my wife and kids. No, if you're married, it's too late. If you want to be without care, don't get married. Stay single. Well, I don't think I can handle that. All right, well, then get married and be real about it. <laughs> take care of your family. Um, so that's not a complaint. It's simply an observation because your wife, your bride is a ministry that you take on as a husband. And ministering to her is, 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 is a very important thing. Um, she's God's daughter. And if you've, if you've ever been the dad who gave away his daughter, then you can imagine how God feels about giving his daughter to you. He's like, you better take good care of her. <laughs> I think we need to realize that. She's a ministry in and of it, in and of it herself. And she's a ministry I want to be able to look back and say I'm being faithful in. Because I know I'm one of those guys who I do ministry all the time and I, I wouldn't take time for anything else. But, I, but because of scripture, I make sure to prioritize this relationship. Now, what about when she fails, when she sins, when she disrespects the husband or disregards him, rebels against his authority in the home? Now, keep in mind, as I said last time, the husband's never called to force the wife to submit. That's an ungodly, abusive behavior. The wife is called to submit, but she submits herself. This is, it's still in her power. She's making the choice. She's making the decision. The husband's never called to tell his wife to do this or make her do this. So let's suppose that she rebels. What is he supposed to do? Well... He's supposed to show her love. That's what he's supposed to do. <laughs> in fact, this in counseling with couples has been the most difficult thing for the guy to swallow in my experience. I've seen a guy walk in with counseling who's big smile on his face. And I'm sharing with him about the, the role of the husband in the, in the, in the um, relationship. And to be honest, in this relationship, the wife was not interested in her role or following Jesus for that matter. And so I said, but you believe in Christ and you want to follow Christ. I said, okay, well, then your job is to love her even if she's very mistreating you and being unloving to you. And being horrible to you, your job is to love her anyways. And he left there with a, with a very sad face. <laughs> Other than the one, because he thought, I thought it was going to be all about her. And then it ended up being all about me. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I get that. But, but that's your call. And you're the one who's saying you're going to follow Jesus. This is your chance to show love. I, I had a guy write me a letter when we first got married. And he said, Mike, when your wife mistreats you, this is your chance to show the love of Christ to her. Because you know what? When you're feeling great and when you're feeling fine and she's treating you fantastic, this is not your chance to show the love of Christ. You're just reciprocating. <laughs> it's just natural. Of course I'm loving you right now. We're in love. you know. But when I'm offended or hurt or embarrassed or, or, what, or feeling betrayed, that is when the love of Christ can be shown. 
Now, in the Bible, there is really not a lot of good examples of husbands. Have you noticed this? We're told that we can look to Sarah as a great example of a wife. We are not told that we can look to Abraham as a great example of a husband. In fact, I racked my brain trying to think of somewhere in the scripture where we have this really great example of a godly man who loved ministry and serving God, but was also a good husband. And there's only one I can think of offhand. And his name's Hosea. And his example is going to depress all of the men. (laughs) Hosea is told by God to marry a prostitute, to take her in and to love her. She cheats on him. He takes her back. She leaves him, has kids with other people, falls into prostitution and slavery. He buys her back and takes her in again. She, she ha, he has biblical grounds for divorce, but does not do it. No, he takes her in and he loves her and he keeps her and eventually she stays with him. We don't even know if she ended up being a great spouse or not, but he's an example of a good husband. Wow. What did he do? He took her sins on himself and said, I'll just bear the weight of this Lord with your strength. And I'm just going to love her unconditionally, unendingly and without any boundaries to it. I'm just going to love her. And that's our our example. Then we have one example that's even harder to follow. And his name is Jesus, who what? Gave himself for the church. And so what we see consistently is a self-sacrificial love for the bride. This does not mean that our wives are somehow evil or, or, but the point is we're given these really extreme examples so that we'll realize it's always time to love. (laughs) No matter what, it's always time to love on my bride. Um, So Ephesians 5.29, it says this, that no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. And for me, I highlight those two words, nourish and cherish, because I think that the context is that this is about how a husband should take care of his bride, just as Christ takes care of the church. Christ nourishes and cherishes. The husband nourishes and cherishes his own body. And so he should do this for his bride as he treats her like his own body. So I'm to nourish and cherish. Now, this is interesting. A husband does have a role as a provider. And that's the nourishment. I'm, I'm giving you what you need. But the prov- provision comes not only financially, but also spiritually, emotionally. I, you know, sometimes I, I see my wife and I think, we haven't spent a lot of time together in the past couple of days. We just need to hang out, you know? And so we just, just sit together and watch some stupid show, watch like some cooking show or I don't know, something, play a game or, or whatever, go out and just drive somewhere, just do something because I can see that our, our relationship needs that nourishment. But there's other times where just she needs something. And rather than look upon her and think, oh, you need that and you should just man up or something like that. Rather, minister to that need because that's my role as husband. Now, what's cool about this is this is not my natural self. This is what scripture calls me to do. And I love that, that God God knows marriage. He knows what's needed. He knows what, what wives need. He knows what husbands need. So we're to nourish, but we're also to cherish. And to cherish, oh, that's, well, I mean, you think of the song, cherish is the word I use to remind me of, you know. <laughs> To cherish is to tenderly care for. To cherish, it could actually be the word for imparting warmth onto something. You know, like when, when you sit next to the fireplace and you're being warmed by it, that, that would be that would be being, being cherished. And it has to do with comforting. So I'm to look and always be learning how to show her her precious place in our lives. Her precious place to me, that that I cherish this woman. Now, I'm not going to do it perfectly. And of course, this is the ideal. And I'll fail and I need to get up and I need to get on the path again when I fail. But this is our calling, to nourish and to cherish her. And so I I try to remind myself of these words and I encourage husbands to do the same. To learn and study Ephesians, ignoring the part about what your wife's supposed to do and focusing on the part about what we're supposed to do. Because I can't be the evaluator of her. It's hers unto the Lord. I'm not her evaluator. I'm not her boss like that. I have an authority in the marriage, but I'm not, I'm not the boss. That's, gosh, if your boss followed you home and tried to be the boss of everything you did, you wouldn't uh, have a good relationship with him. <laughs> um, but I do make decisions, but my decisions are therefore then to bless my wife and provide safety and godliness in the home. Um, so turn to another passage. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Here's another word that comes up, and it's the word bitter. And I want to look at it because it applies to husbands. Colossians chapter 3, after in verse 18, telling the wives to submit to their own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Then in verse 19, he says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be 
bitter toward them. Now, that is really a strange to me thing to say. Of, of, of all that God could tell us in this passage, he has one word for husbands, to love their wives and then not to be bitter toward them. That word bitter, it doesn't mean bitterness in the typical sense you might think of when I'm holding a grudge, although obviously we're not to hold grudges. We're told not to hold grudges. But it means to not be harsh. This bitterness is more of like a flavor that comes across as I speak, as with my glances, with my with my hand motions or whatever it is I'm doing, to have a harsh or sharp-edged demeanor toward my spouse. It is interesting that in relationships that are long, old relationships, somebody can do something and from the outside in, you'd see someone does something, they say like, how are you today? And then this person over here is like really offended because they saw through what that was and they knew what was really behind it and what they really meant. And I had some great advice given to me when I uh, was just engaged with Allison and I said, well, I think she was doing this because of this. And, um, and it was Pastor Mac who told me, he said, don't go there. <laughs> and it was the best advice ever. It was just like, like, don't, don't go there. Which translated was like, you are such a fool. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're trying to read minds. And, and what we do is we read our fears and our insecurities into the minds of our spouse. And then we respond to them with harshness, with bitterness, with a defensive behavior, like a porcupine shooting those quills out. And that, that's unfortunate. So I'm called not to be bitter toward them. Now, the opposite of that bitterness is what Proverbs 19.22 says. It says, what is desired in a man is kindness. And I never forget that. When I read that verse as a young boy, and I thought about my stepdad, who was not very kind. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it was unpleasant, you know. And I thought, in one word, what I wish this guy had was just kindness. I didn't care if he told me what to do. I just wish he had kindness. I wish it was flavored with some kindness, you know. And I think that as, as guys, we can sometimes get this like on the job mentality where we're harsh and we're like, nah, matter of fact, and, da, 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 and we forget to flavor it with kindness. But, but you, you learn this over time because you see the same guy that's harsh and bah, da, bah, da, bah, da, bah. when he's a grandpa, oh, he's all kinds of kind and well, hopefully <laughs> mellow. But a lot of these guys, we, we, we get our edges worn down you know, over time. And we learn that there's a, there, what is desired in a man is kindness. And what is desired from my bride to me is that I just be kind, a gentleness and in, in, to take whatever I'm doing and I add some gentleness to it, some kindness to it, you know. Whatever I need to say, whatever, I, if I need to confront or add some kindness to it, add some understanding, add something there that, that would take away that bitterness, that harshness. And then in, um, back to First Peter, back to First Peter. So here we are, First Peter 3, 7. Let's unpack this verse. Now that we've got all that out, I'm actually really excited to teach this because I'm fully convinced of the wonder and goodness of God's word to husbands. And as you can see, it has been largely lost in our media and in our in our culture. And um, and it is a a wonderful thing when a husband takes up this call. First Peter three seven says, "Husbands likewise dwell with them, their wives, with understanding." giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. So husbands here are encouraged to dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. And I want to say just real quick, women's rights are super important. And wherever the gospel has gone and biblical Christianity has gone, women's rights have been elevated and lifted up. But some people think that if they acknowledge any quality a man has that a woman doesn't have, they're somehow being sexist. Like as if I were to say, you know, men are generally taller than women. I'm now sexist. <laughs> like this is somehow a negative thing, but this is the world we live in. It's as though I can make all these observations about men and women and how we're different, but I can't say it out loud or I'm in a lot of trouble. Sometimes it's even worse. You can say nice things about, about women and bad things about men, but you can't say the other. So that I can say women are more sensitive than men. Women are prettier than men, which is certainly true. <laughs> Women are more nurturing than men and have better natural parenting skills typically than men. Women have this amazing ability to bear children and that, is, that just blows my mind. Like that is a special thing a woman can do that a guy never gets to experience. And um, part of me doesn't want to experience part of it, but, <laughs> but it, is, it is just so amazing. I mean, it's just miraculous, right? But you're not allowed to say things like, men are better at hard labor and battle. We're better designed for that sort of thing. Men are better leaders in general than women are. Now that 
now like the laser beams are showing up and we are, so picketing will begin shortly and oh my video just got banned on YouTube or something. But some people just overreact to these things. So here's the question. What quality is meant when the Bible says that the woman, the bride, is the weaker vessel? What is meant by that in 1 Peter 3, 7? Well, it's in, it's in the word vessel. You see, it's only the vessel that is weaker. And the Bible uses the term vessel to talk about our bodies, our physical bodies, our physical nature. And it is just that that is weaker in the woman. And this is, this is a, a truth. She's not morally weaker. She's not spiritually weaker. She's not intellectually weaker. In fact, um, gosh, it seems to me that women tend to be more spiritual than men. Um, sadly, not because of the women, because of the men. <laughs> that's, that's the sad part. But there are things that have to do with motherhood that cause a woman's body to be weaker than a man's. Stronger for bearing children, but weaker in other things. They don't handle cold as well, for instance. And part of that's because they're they're holding in their core temperature to protect the womb area. And so they're not going to handle cold as well, typically. You know, how do I know it's cold in the room and I have to turn the heater on? I go, ladies, are you cold? And if they're like, yeah, we're cold, then we turn the heater on. Um, did you know that a, a man and a woman of the same weight, same exact weight, the man has approximately 15% more muscle mass than the woman does? So 150-pound man, 150-pound woman. 15% more muscle mass on the guy. Women have much less strength physically on average than men do. About half of the upper body strength. For instance, and when you're enlisting in the Marines, the U.S. Marines, to qualify, you've got you've to do three pull-ups if you're a guy. If you're a woman, you don't have to do any pull-ups at all. Now, is that unfair? No, because women aren't men. Why should men have to do what women do or men, women have to do what men do? This is, this is, we are different. It's silly to think we're not. I mean, why do you think pro football doesn't have mixed genders? Because that would be insane. Now, there may be a super rare woman who could just like take out every guy on the team. But in general, that's insane. This is wrong. When we go to our high school camps and they do dodgeball every year, every year I go up to the leaders and I go, hey, you're going to do dodgeball? I'm not a huge fan of dodgeball with these new balls they have that break faces and stuff. It's like really not cool. But... I said, let's just do a water balloon fight. Anyway, so they do dodgeball and I go, are you going to mix the genders? And then they're like, oh, yeah, I think so. And I'm like, man, these young pastors don't know what to do. Don't put this 14-year-old girl in with a 17-year-old guy who's throwing missiles across the field, you know? Because every time there's a girl crying on the side of the field, she's got a headache now. Her face is all red. And it's just like, this is just unwise. Let's not pretend that men and women are the same. They're wonderfully different by design. This is not merely socialization. A lot of people say, oh, men and women are only different because of socialization. Men are more interested in, boys are more interested in like these types of toys and those types of games because we've we've made them that way. You know, fathers force their kids to be interested in cowboys and mothers force their girls to be interested in Barbie or something like that. And this is, this is silly. If you've ever had, I mean, who here has had a boy and a girl? Yeah, they're different. Now, I'm not saying that guys are always on this end of the spectrum and girls are always on this end of the spectrum. But boys and girls are different. Boys are boys and girls are girls. And no matter how maybe even feminine a guy is, he's still a guy. He's still a dude, right? And there are some very obvious differences between the male females, which I don't think I need to get into. So the weaker vessel issues really shouldn't be controversial. It's literally, she's a weaker vessel. So I, what do I do? Seeing that my bride is the weaker vessel, I... Oh, oh, there's one area, though, ladies, I'll tell you, and this, this applies to the moment because I feel as though I'm contracting some sort of flu or something right now, right? Interestingly, women's bodies are better equipped to handle um, dis, uh, illness. And I think that has to do with the mothering, with the mothering thing. God's equipped you to be able to, to you know, here you are sick, but you're handling it well and you're taking care of everybody in the house, you know. And, um, and so this maybe should make the guys feel better because it always seems like we get it worse, right? Maybe we really do get it worse and we're not just being babies. <laughs> so I'm to dwell with her with understanding. What am I to understand? That she's different and that that difference gives me a place to show her love. Now God tells me what to do with the fact that she has a weaker physical vessel and it shows me that my result is not dishonor but rather the opposite. First Peter 3, 7, to honor her. Giving honor to her as a weaker vessel. So this can't be used as oppression or something like that. She's made in the image of God. She's a co-heir in the grace of life or a full partner in Christ. 
a full partner in Christ. She's as in the image of God as I am. Genesis 1.27, listen to this. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. See, man is a term representing mankind, males and females. When God talks to women in the Bible, he says women or females. When he talks to men, he says men. And when he's talking to women and men, he says men. That's just how it, because we're mankind. We're, we're all humans, human, human. You know, that's, that's the idea. And so um, we're all in the image of God. And so she's to get honor. So how do I honor her? Well, I open the door. Uh, I carry the thing. I take the bullet. I haven't got to do that yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I, I suffer the loss or the sacrifice if there's one to be made. Um, women don't handle hunger as well as men. It's just true. This is typically true. Yeah. So if one of us is going to not get to eat enough, then it should be me. I think that that's a fulfillment of this calling here. Um, I treat her as precious and as someone to be protected. I treat her as an equal, though. I mean, I have the authority in the marriage, but I don't bully, ignore, or marginalize her. I honor her. I honor her. That authority is given to me so I can do something for her. Protect, nourish, cherish, love. I daily set aside my needs to take care of hers. That's my calling. And then the danger in 1 Peter 3, 7, it says that your prayers may not be hindered. This to me says, husbands, your ministry of your marriage is so important that God will not let you get away with failing in this ministry. It will hinder your very prayer life. So some guys, they think like, I can, you know, it's really stressful. They're feeling overwhelmed and they abandon their, their responsibilities at home. And so they're, they're really great at work. And they're really great when they're hanging with their buddies. But when it comes to home, they're just dropping the ball. And God's saying, no, I will not let you get away with that. Your very prayers will be hindered. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to honor me here. Now, this does not mean that it's the husband's responsibility to make it a great marriage. It's just his job to do his job. He may do all these things and find that it's not a great marriage. By some definition, you know. Uh, and that's fine. He's honoring Christ. And that should be enough because he's doing it unto the Lord. So we have to ask ourselves if we're looking at marriage to enjoy a romance or to fulfill a ministry as unto the Lord. And I think if you look at it as fulfilling a ministry as unto the Lord, you will enjoy a lot more romance than is if you look at it to have romance. Now, there's a couple other verses that I just want to take you guys to since we're on this topic. And one of them is uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And it talks about the role of women as homemakers, which I think is interesting that the scripture actually weighs in on this, but I want to carefully look at it. Titus 2, 4 and 5, it says, uh, speaking of the older women, that they teach the younger women. Remember last week when I said, hey, ladies, this is actually your job to teach to younger women these things. Um, well, here's the passage that's from. So Titus 2, 4, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now, that word homemakers is what I want to focus on. It actually means workers at home. Like, literally, that's what the word means, the etymology of it. Workers at home. Um, now, I have heard this preached from this passage that women should not have a job outside the home, but they should only work in the home and that you're failing somehow. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think you get that much out of this word. But it does mean the bride should be working at home. That she should not abandon the, the wife and mother responsibilities at home and just work outside the home and, and maybe hire it out to somebody else or that sort of thing. But rather, there is a labor to be done at home. Now, Proverbs 31 has a woman who's described as, I mean, now, guys, don't expect your wife to be Proverbs 31, right? What, what does it start with? Like, the, the virtuous woman. Who can find her? It's like, <laughs> good luck. But it's still a wonderful thing we can learn from, right? And so you've got this woman who works at home. You know, her children don't lack bread. And this, she takes care of her kids. She takes care of her husband. I like how he's known in the gates. It says he's known in the gates. I think it's like he gets there and he opens up his lunch bag. And they're like, you got what? <laughs> and he's known in the gates. And, um, and she works at her home. She makes sure her home is being cared for. That the mom and wife role is happening in the home. But she also, with her money, she buys a field. And she's like working, has her own business. She's running her own farming type business going on on the side. So it's not like you can't have a job. That's not, I don't think, the statement from scripture, but it's rather just don't neglect the home. We can get stressed out 
and we can abandon some of our home responsibilities because it's just easier to not think about it. But um, but so wives to be um, homemakers or workers at home, I think is a, a good thing, good reminder. And then 1 Timothy 5.8, <clears throat> this will be the last verse for tonight. I want to take you guys to. This is about the guys. Speaking of men as providers, does the Bible weigh in on should guys be bringing in the bacon, so to speak? Actually, the Bible probably wouldn't tell you to bring the bacon in, would it? <laughs> Not in the Old Testament, anyways. So, <clears throat> the husband is told, um, well, said about a husband. 1 Timothy 5 If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So, a uh, woman's told, you know, this this homemaker responsibility, which doesn't mean she can't work outside the home as well, but she doesn't neglect the responsibilities in the home. And the husband is told he must provide. And if he doesn't, he's worse than an unbeliever. That is a really strong statement being made there. Now, it's possible that a man cannot provide because of disability or certain things or situations that come up, right? But this is not about, this is about a guy who simply does not. He simply doesn't. He's not taking care. I remember meeting a guy one time who uh, we met, I met him at the park. Crazy. I mean, he was literally crazy. And he said that he believed that everything that we're seeing it was um, an imagination. We're all just having this sort of group dream. And he says there's really only one person, and it's everything. And there's there's no you, there's no me, there's just I. And the tree is I, and the clouds are I, and the sky is I, and the the universe is just one being. And we just we just don't forget we just forget about that. And so I try to challenge him when I'm when I'm approaching someone who has like a really radical view. I I like to challenge them on it because. People almost never live out their actual radical views. They just say it as excuses to get away from responsibilities, in my experience. And that's what he did. He told me about how he actually had a wife and two children at home. And he's living on the street. And so I, I thought, oh, Lord, give me wisdom. I, I want to help this guy snap out of it, you know. So I said, how do your wife and kids feel about your religious views? And he didn't want to talk about that. And I, and I told him, I said, well, in my worldview, your wife and your children are real people that you need to go take care of. But he was like, well, I'm trying to abandon all that I need and da, 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 da. And he, he was just loopy. He was just loopy. But in, in the end, it allowed him to live a very lazy lifestyle where he just kind of rode around on his bike and told people about his imaginations and stuff and didn't really do anything um, to earn money. He probably went and took handouts. I know he doesn't mind taking their real money and spending it, but he doesn't want to earn any of his own. Um, very unfortunate, very unfortunate. But this, this is the statement. If a, God, if a guy doesn't provide for his own, if I'm not taking care of my home, then I cannot make up for that by doing great stuff outside the home. I need to take care of the home. I got to take care of my house. I got to take care of my kids. This doesn't mean they won't rebel. This doesn't mean my wife will treat me with, in the way that I want her to. It just means that I will, I will fulfill my ministry as unto the Lord, just to do my job. And if you failed in this, um, you know, and you're hearing this this message, and you failed in any capacity in this, whether it's you're in the room or if you're hearing it online. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, it is a big deal, but now the worst thing to do is to despair and to just be trapped in it because you feel, oh, it's over, I failed. You know, tomorrow's still coming, and tomorrow can be a different day than yesterday, and that's why God always calls us to respond to the things He shows us and not to curl up in a ball <laughs> and die. He never says curl up and die, no matter how many times you were told that in elementary school. Um, all right, well, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for your word to husbands and wives. It is a high calling, and it is something that every one of us fails at to some extent. So Lord, we thank you for your grace, because your grace and your mercy sustains us every day. But we do pray this, Lord. Help us to be better at this task, at these jobs of honoring you of doing this ministry unto you, Lord, when we don't feel like it and when we've got ingrained behaviors that go against what your word tells us. Lord, may we just do what you say. We pray that you'd awaken our hearts to be husbands who are after you, Lord, and to be brides, wives who are after you. May we glorify you in that, Lord, and may we bear the, the fruit that comes from doing it your way. We love you, God, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lord, for your 